talking about using Java 9 modules and not preparing for Java 9 modules, which has been basically the last 10 years. Um, so a little bit about me. So if you have questions about the presentation, these are my coordinates. Um, I'll have the last slide, I'll have a link to how to reach me as well. So if you have questions after the, the presentation, feel free to use that. Um, I'm co-author on the EJB3 in action and also as co-author on the NetBeans, now Apache NetBeans uh, certification guide. Um, and I'm also a member of the Java EE Guardians and NetBeans Dream Team. Um, so, uh, Project Jigsaw, which is Java 9 modules, um, makes, so there are several goals with uh, Java 9 modules. Um, one is to make the platform more scalable for small computing devices so that you do not need to download the entire JRE or... Okay, ah, that's much better. Um, so one of the goals was to make the platform more scalable for small computing devices, um, improve platform security and maintainability. Um, over the last several years, there's been quite a few security exploits on the Java platform, tying down with people being able to drill into private APIs as they probably shouldn't have been able to. Um, to enable improved application performance, um, and simplify the library creation, simplify library creation and application development. Um, and also, the, the two primary goals would be to provide reliable configuration and also strong encapsulation, both of which have been basically lacking from the Java platform. Um, so currently, or previous, prior to Java 9, uh, Java suffered from jar hell. Um, with, with thousands of jars and no way to actually manage dependencies between them. You could actually load, and I've seen production systems with over 400 jar files on them, duplicate jar files and duplicate packages, and had to spend, have had to spend enormous amounts of time trying to troubleshoot um, problems where, two where we have you know, two, two versions of the same class on the class path that were included from two different places and it resulted in unpredictable behavior. So that's what I mean with the current sufferers from jar hell is that there is no easy way to manage it and actually ensure that an application would correctly start up. Um, Maven tracks dependencies, but there is no runtime enforcement, right? So you can specify what your dependencies are, but at runtime it can be a completely different situation. Um, there's no guarantee that, it, prior to Java 9, there's no guarantee that an application could actually start. So although an application may have compiled, at runtime you may actually get uh, no class definition errors at runtime. Um, and it was possible, as I mentioned, to mix uh, library versions on the class path. For example, you could mix uh, Commons IO 2.5 and 1.6 on the class path. You may have two separate, you know, you may be customizing something at a client site. A, a consultant pulls in Commons 1.6. Uh, what actually happens at runtime? Which one gets used? And very often that depends upon the order of the, uh, the, the class path and how it was constructed. Um, and then finally, existing module frameworks such as OSGI uh, couldn't be used to actually modularize the Java platform itself. So I'll actually cover that in some detail, the, the modularization of the platform itself, because Java 9 modules are not just how to write module code yourself, um, but they also took and revamped the entire JDK, the entire uh, JRE. And so this is probably one of the largest changes to the Java platform since it was first introduced. Um, so Project Jigsaw Java modules is actually split up into several Java enhancement uh, proposals. Um, so we have uh, 200, which was the modular JDK, uh, modular source code, uh, module runtime, ish, uh, runtime images, which I'll touch on briefly. Um, 260 was to encapsulate most of the internal APIs, uh, things that you were not supposed to have ever drilled in or used before. Uh, 261 was the actual module system. Uh, JLink, the Java linker, which I'll talk a little bit about. Um, and then uh, JSR 376 was the overarching um, specification for the module system. So, the last couple of times I've given talks on Java, Java 9, it has been preparing for the, for the modules. Um, it is now, they released it on September 21st. Um, and if your users go out to download Java right now, they'll be taken to a landing web page and told to download Java 9. So that's actually pulled from the Oracle site as of yesterday. So 
Um, as you can see, Java 9 is out there and users are downloading it and installing it. So it's no longer a theoretical, you know, when this Java module is coming out, it is out and it is now in the user, end user's hands. So comparing uh, Project Jigsaw to OSGI and Java E, which is most often, most often compared to, um, Jigsaw, of course, does not address everything. It does not reduce the need for OSGI. Um, you can definitely, uh, OSGI is something that you should definitely consider going forward. Um, uh, Jigsaw does not allow cycles between packages and different modules. Um, it doesn't have isolated package namespaces. Um, it doesn't allow lazy loading um, in the same sense that OSGI does. Um, it, it doesn't allow multiple versions of an artifact on the class path at the same time. It doesn't allow package splits. Um, or textual descript descriptors. So it's a very limited subset of the features that you get from OSGI or from Java E. So it doesn't replace those technol doesn't replace those technologies. You still use them. It just it's it's more at a core part of the uh, the Java runtime. Um, so how does OSG how does the the new Java module system compare to, for example, OSGI? Um, it's actually implemented at a lower level. Both OSGI and Java EE are implemented using class loaders, um, which obviously they can't use to actually modularize the Java platform itself. So with Java 9, they've actually gone in and the, the module system is actually implemented deep within the JVM. So at the base, you have the Java virtual machine. Sitting on top of that, you have the Java module system. And then you have your different class loaders, et cetera, uh, sitting on top of that. So it's at a much lower level of enforcement within the platform, which means that you cannot easily defeat it. So some common questions that come up with uh, the Java 9 modules, given that it's such a large change to the platform, do I have to modularize my application to run on Java 9? And the answer is no. Um, if your application should continue to, if your application works on 8, it for the most part should continue to work on 9. You do not have to refactor it. You don't have to convert it over to Java 9 modules in order to, in order to run on the platform. Will my Java 6, 7, 8 application compile on Java 9? It depends. It depends upon whether you're using internal APIs. So for example, if you've gone off and subclassed the innards of the uh, uh, Nimbus look and feel, probably not. You'll run into trouble and you'll have to make code changes for your application. So it depends upon what level the APIs you're interacting with the JVM and whether you were using anything that starts with com.sun or used, uh, turning off, you know, set, you know, using reflection to drill into private APIs in the JVM. Will my Java 6, 7 application run unmodified on Java 9? It depends, once again, depends upon your use of private APIs. And not just your use of private APIs, your dependencies uses of private APIs. So if you depend upon an open source project that's drilling into the JVM and hasn't been updated in several years, you're going to have to address that now in order to run on Java 9. And how do you identify problems today? Um, since Java, I believe Java 8 or, or, or possibly even as far back as Java 7, they've introduced this jdepends command line utility, which has been a part of the JDK. Using jdepends, you can aim it at a jar file and say, what are the dependencies of this? Will this have any trouble running on Java 9? And it will give you a nice printout telling you your dependencies and also what issues your code has or will have with Java 9. Um, can I partially le leverage modules? So say you have a large application and you want to start taking advantage of modular support. Um, yes, you can, you can start to leverage it. You don't have to convert. It's not an all or nothing switch. It's not I have to switch everything over to modules or I don't get to use modules at all. So you can actually, you can use modules. You can start to gradually use modules in your application. Is the tooling ready? Mostly, it's getting there. Um, the, as we'll see with the Maven Gradle, they're not actually generating the module info things for you, uh, files for you. You still have to generate them the, yourselves. Uh, the tools now, since back in June when I first gave a presentation on Java 9 modules, um, the tools actually do run now on Java 9. It used to be six months ago that you couldn't even get Maven or Gradle to actually fire up without some editing property files and kind of mucking around with it to try to get it to run. Um, and then in the case of Maven, although Maven, Maven proper runs on Java 9, not all the plugins work correctly. Uh, do application containers on 9? Maybe. Um, I know that the Glassfish container does not run on 9. Um, they're still certified to run on 8, not on 9. So if you're developing for 
a Java, Java EE application, you'll still be stuck on Java 8 for a while. You won't be able to make the jump to 9 for, until the application containers have actually moved. Um, is Java 9 being installed on client machines? Yes, as a screenshot that I, I showed before. So if somebody goes up to the Oracle website to download Java, they're going to be taken to the Java 9 downloads page. Um, now, one of the things that I mentioned is that modules are not, just not for your application. They've also modularized the Java platform. Um, so the JDK is, is modularized, and it's hard to see graph here. There's, there's lots of modules, and I actually zoom in on part of it. So um, the JDK is modularized, so you'll see, you know, uh, JavaFX have its, has its own package. Uh, there's a separate XML package. So they've, they've really, the, the Java platform, so now when you go to import, import code, and if you're, if you're running a modular application, as, we sit, as, as I'll show you in a little bit, um, you now have to know which module you're pulling a dependency from with the JDK. So when you go up to look at the Java doc, you're going to look at the Java doc for not only the class, you're also going to check to see what module you need to include in your code. What module do you, does your code have to actually require? So now, in addition to importing code, you also have to add a requires statement specifying which one of the JDK modules you require for your application. Um, so as I mentioned, JDEPS earlier is a command line tool included with Java 8. Um, it is a static class dependency checker. Uh, the key parameters to it are JDK internals, um, which flags internal API usage that will break in Java 9. Um, a dot output, which will output um, a, a basically a, a file format that you can use to generate that graph that I had in the previous slide. So if you want a visualization of what your dependencies are, you use dot output, it'll output some dot files, which you can then use, I forget the name of the open source utility, but it'll actually render a nice graph that you saw on the previous slide of your dependencies. Um, dash CP, if you want to analyze the class path for like, a given application, provide a bunch of jars and say, you know, what are the dependencies between them and what are the conflicts. Um, dash verbose, um, which will print out a, a much more verbose output with package level dependencies. Um, so you want to use JDEPS on all of your generated output for, for your applications today, as well as all of your dependencies. So it's not just enough that you run it on your own code, you have to run it on every jar file that you're including in your application to find out about potential conflicts or problems. Um, so this is an example right here where I've run it against a common uh, Swing component library called uh, Jide, uh, uh, the Jide library. So this is Jide Common, um, has a bunch of extensions that are commonly used if you're implementing desktop software for Java. Um, and as you can see, they've got a lot of work to do. There's a lot of dependencies on JDTK internal APIs which are going to cause problems on Java 9 and which will ultimately have to be addressed. So this is one of the, the, the things that I really want to stress, that your application code may be fine. You may have no trouble running on Java 9. However, one of your dependencies may not be up to date, and you have to take that into account. And you have to look at everything that your code take, it requires to actually run and whether it's compatible with Java 9. Um, now, as part of the JDEPS, uh, Oracle has put together a nice website that lists out common problems that you may run into with your code along with the solutions. Um, so, for example, they have, if you're using the base, you know, the, the Sun Miss uh, Base64 decoder and encoders, um, they've actually added that since uh, Java 8, there's a Java Util Base64. So that one's fairly easy to fix. Um, so there's a link at the bottom of the page there. They have it's pretty well documented what the changes are to the Java platform and what you need to do in order to fix your code to make it run on Java 9. Okay. Um, in addition, there is a Maven plugin. So if you're using Maven as your build system, which you can also use this from Gradle, there's the JDEPS plugin, um, which you can add to your build. And as a part, every time you do a build, it'll tell you where you stand with uh, Java 9 support, whether you have any dependencies upon internals, etc. So you can ensure that no additional code gets checked in that, have that, that, that will break or have troubles with Java 9 in the module system. Um, so that's basically a nice introduction to you know, the, the basics of the modules. Now let's, let's look at how to actually do stuff. So um, this, is, this is Java 8 um, today, um, not Java 9. So if I have a meeting service interface and a meeting service implementation, and I want to only expose the meeting service interface and, and preclude 
uh, developers that are using the package for drilling into the service, I can't do that in Java 8. And we'll see how to do this in Java 9. But with Java 8, one of the problems was that although you had interfaces available, you couldn't restrict somebody from doing a cast and getting at the imp actual implementation. So that is what has changed with Java 9, and when you, when you start to use Java 9 modules, you can actually restrict somebody that's using your API from drilling in and using classes that you don't want them to use, right? So you now have control over it. You no longer have to worry, you know, is somebody using um, an implementation class? So has somebody inadvertently done a cast somewhere to get a hold of something? So with Java 9, really, the, it actually solves this problem. So, you know, as, as I was trying to point out, how do you hide the implementation class, with, which with prior to Java 9, you could not. So with, with Java 8, uh, with Java 8 and Java 9, we, in, in Java 8 we had, for what rate, we had public protected package and then private as our, our protections. Now with Java 9, we've got public, public to specific modules, public only within a module, protected package and private. So there's actually been quite a, quite a bit of changes then with uh, Java accessibility. So with Java modules, um, they've added a new uh, file name that you add to the root of your class path, uh, the root package, I'm sorry, um, which is module-info.java. Um, this is actually an improper name for a class, so it's ignored by the compiler, um, the compiler is prior to Java 9. Um, and the contents are the following, the unique name of the module, the dependencies of the module, the packages to be exported and used by other modules. Um, and as I mentioned, this place at the root of the namespace. So this is an example module definitions uh, at the bottom. So we have module name is org ct java services, and it's exporting basically a package that's the same name as the module. Um, so then another package can actually Another module can actually say that I can actually depend upon that and gain access to all of the, the public classes that are in that services package. Uh, so the module definition file, this is basically what can actually go into it. And I'll go over this in a little more depth as, as, as we go through the presentation. But you have the module, the module name. Uh, for the module name, a good practice right now that's been pushed is reverse domain name. Uh, the, same, the same structure that you've been using for uh, uh, package names for Java um, requires, it was basically saying that you depend upon another module, um, provides to get into the, eight, provides and uses tie into the service API, which we'll discuss in a few minutes. Um, but this is basic, this is the basic structure of the file and all the possible things that you can put in it. Um, so the module names must be unique, the name should follow the reverse domain name pattern. Uh, modules are eagerly, eagerly loaded. Uh, the dependency graph is built and checked on startup. So this is one of the things with Java 9 is that you always know your application will start. You'll never have to worry about a, a class getting a class not found exception. Um, so applications won't start if modules are missing. So if module dependency cannot be resolved, the application won't start. Um, one of the things with the Java 9 modules is that there's no support for versioning. Um, only one version of a module may be loaded. Um, now, there is a separate concept, which I don't get into in another presentation, which is called layers. And layers, you can use layers to load different versions of a module. So if you're implementing an application container, for instance, you'd use layers to handle being able to load different versions of different, different jar files um, in for the different applications you're deploying. But out of the box, uh, you, if, if you're just running with a vanilla JVM and not using layers, you can only load one version of a module. About versioning, um, two modules with the same package name in them are considered to be different versions of the same module. Um, two modules with the same name are considered to be two versions of the same module. Right? Uh, concealed package conflicts, and this is one that I think that will trip a lot of people up and possibly require refactoring of code. When two modules have the same package name in them, but the package is private in both modules, the module system cannot load both modules into the same Layer. So that means that if you've got, you know, com mycompany.util in several different modules, right, you, if it's a common pattern that you had in, in your, with, with um, organizing your code, that's going to present a problem for Java 9 modules. Um, so you'll have to ref, uh, refactor that. Um, now, with Java 9, um, you, we're familiar with the class path. They've introduced the module path. So module path arguments, so there's 
a, a whole suite of module path arguments, which basically extend what you had with the class path. All command line and tool tools now include both, so you have both the module path and the class path uh, parameters. So for the module path, and I've only printed out a subset of what I consider the important ones, but we've got the module module path, upgrade module path, um, dry run, which allows you to see what's actually going to be used. Um, so use Java dash. Um, so those are the some of the key uh, parameters that they've added. And you can use list modules to see all the available modules um, on the platform. So you can use uh, Java dash list modules or print to a list of modules that you can use. For JDK modules, so looking back to the uh, modularization of the, the JDK platform, um, just like java.lang is included by default so you don't have to import that in your Java code, uh, JDK.base is included by default, so you don't have to de declare that your code has a dependency on JDK base. That's included by default. Uh, Java SE and Java SEEE are aggregator modules, which means that they don't actually contain any code. They just pull in several other modules. Um, Java SEEE contains the following modules. Um, so this one is an aggregator module containing Corba transactions, you know, the web services stuff, and activation. Uh, Java runs with the Java SE modules, so when you go to run your code, it's going to run with Java SE modules, not uh, Java SEE, and we'll see in a couple of slides where that becomes a problem if you're running a, writing a Java SE application that uses web services. It's obviously not going to find the web services APIs or the activation APIs when you go to startup, so you'll have to add, you'll have to do something different for that. Uh, now, one of the things that I mentioned earlier on is that with Java 9 modules, you cannot have de uh, dependency cycles. So in this case right here, um, we have model, uh, org ct java model package and org ct java util package both having dependencies on each other. Um, so that, that's obviously not allowed, um, and, that, um, and they both depend upon Java base. Now, a slightly more complicated example is where we have a cycle between multiple packages. And we'll get into basically a solution of that using the, uh, the Java the change enhancements of the Java Services API. Uh, but this is also um, precluded, which may re may result in you having to refactor some of your existing code if you have cycles. If you have loose modules in your system right now and people have added dependencies between them, this may cause this will definitely cause problems. The module system will definitely choke on this. So a simple module example, um, taking the the code that I had before. So I have a meeting service interface um, with an implementation and I can define a, um, in the module file I specify that I export the services, a, the services package and not the implementation. So thereby anybody that's using this, they're limited to only using, they can only see the interface, they cannot actually see the implementation. And you can see at the bottom I place the line of code necessary to do the to compile it. Um, and the, the one caveat I will say, with the, the new module system, and this is what makes it slightly trickier, um, you cannot use reflection. So you can't even use reflection to access the meeting service impl. So say that you know that meeting service impl exists and you think, well, you know, I'll get around the module system, I'll try to use reflection to get at it. Um, that's precluded. The, system, the, the JVM will kick in and say, no, you can't access that, and will prevent you from even instantiating it, even via reflection. And there's no special flag that you can use that can say, disable, allow me to do this. Um, and then the compiler output, uh, you actually end up with module.info in the, it gets compiled to a class and ends up in the output, and there's even a reflection API that allows you to reflect over the module definitions. So, a slightly more complex example with multiple modules. Um, in this case right here, I have um, the services depending upon the, the model. And over on the right, you can see the layout of the packages and the classes. Um, at the top, I have the module, which has you know, meeting and speakers, two classes. This is an application for managing a Java users group. Um, then down at the bottom, I've got the services, which depend upon the model. Um, so it exports its own services and it requires um, the model from up above. So in order to use any of the classes from the model, it has to have an explicit requires statement. 
right? So otherwise, I can't even import. I, the code won't compile without the requires. So then compiling the code, um, so as you can see, we have to have, it, it gets a little bit trickier because when, when you do the compilation, the folders for different modules, so in this case right here, I have the upper level source directory, and then underneath it, the, direct, the, the two directors that are immediately below it must have the same name as the modules and then contain the source code for the modules within them. So your, the structure of, for using the, def, the, the default Java compiler changes slightly if you're using modules um, in that your modules go right beneath the source code directory and then within those you have your module definitions and the source code for them. So it's a slightly different structure if you're working with, directly with Java C. Um, and not all of the IDEs create that structure. Um, packaging, um, they do have a module version um, when you're using the jar utility. That does not mean that they support versioning. Um, it's just adding a little bit of additional metadata. Um, it's recorded in the module info class so you can actually reflect upon it, but the system isn't actually enforcing it. So, mod okay. so moving on um, to transitive dependencies. So in this case, um, implementing an admin interface that uses a service, and that service depends upon model. Now, if I do not explicitly declare that there's a transitive dependency, so, or, so the uh, org CT job services has a class that I'm using, which uses, takes as one of the a parameter from a, a class in model. Um, now, org CT job admin depends upon org CT uh, uh, services, but it may not know about the model, so it may not include those dependencies. So, in that case, so in this case right here, this is showing you the meeting services class has, takes in a meeting object from model, and if I don't actually declare that there's a transitive dependency here, the code won't actually compile. I won't actually be able to call methods from in services from within the admin package. Um, so to get around this, you add a requires transitive. So in org CT Java services, on the requires statement, I say requires transitive org ctjava.model, which means that anybody that uses my module will also be able to access that and use those classes as well. So you have to give a lot of thought when you're, when you're building up, when you're modularizing your application, you know, what does my module depend upon and are there transitive dependencies from this module that other modules are going to need to use? Um, moving on to qualified exports. So in this case, I have basically the same structure, except I now have the admin interface depends upon JavaFX controls and is, is pro providing that as a UI. Um, and if you try to run that code, um, you'll actually get an error because the JavaFX launcher, when you, when you provide classes to, to, to JavaFX, it turns around and tries to instantiate the code and it can't actually instantiate um, my, so in, in this case, in this example right here, the org CT Java admin has a class which is a stage, a Java effect stage, and you go to run on it, it doesn't actually run because it can't actually reflect in on the, reflect in on my code. Java effects is trying to reflect in on my code to instantiate some UI stuff. So in order to get around that, you add to your module definitions for admin, you say that you export the Java, org CT Java admin package to JavaFX, thereby allowing it to do reflection on your package and instantiate code. Um, and then I'm also specifying that I require JavaFX controls. So just by requiring JavaFX controls doesn't mean that that other package can actually reflect in and use my code. So this is where the exports comes in. Um, and then in, in terms of JavaFX controls, um, the dependency that I had, if you look back at the exception on the previous slide, it came in further down the, the hierarchy. So by defend, depending upon JavaFX controls, I pull in JavaFX graphics, JavaFX base. Uh, the next thing that's actually quite nice that they've added with uh, the Java 9 modules is JLink, which generates a runtime image including the JVM. Only the required modules are included, so the, base, and the basic invocation is this repass to specify your module path. Now, so the demo I used for this one um, on the previous slide with the, uh, the JavaFX 
if I, if I was doing that with a full JDK and distributing the application, I'd have 454 megabytes of stuff to install it because you'd have to install the JRE and then my application. With JLink, it'll actually generate my application bundled with the JVM with just the, the JVM dependencies that my application needs. So in that case, it shrinks down to 95 megs. I'm not using any of the XML packages. I'm only using JavaFX and Java Base. So it shrinks it down to 95 megs. And it provides a nice little launcher for the application as well. So this is a nice step. It makes it easy to create you know, nicely you know, packaged. It allows you to shrink your application down. You don't have to install the full JDK. As a part of your build process, you can run JLink at the end. And you'll get a runtime image that you can then ship off and deploy um, um, client machines. Uh, so digging a little deeper. So deprecated modules, um, kind of, I touched on this a little bit before with the SOAP stuff. So we have some Java 8 code that compiles perfectly fine and runs on Java 8. If you go to run this same code without recompiling it on Java 9, what happens? You get this error, uh, Java lang, uh, no class definition found. Um, it can't find endpoint. So this works on Java 8, right? You didn't recompile it, what happened? Um, well, we have to add that, it goes back to that Java SE EE module stuff that I discussed before. Uh, the Java XML web services stuff is something that's usually provided by a Java EE container. Usually that will be a JAX, w, uh, a JAX um, WS implementation providing the web services stuff. So that's no longer included by default on the platform when you go to run your application. So in this case right here, I have to say, you know, I need this module added so that we can actually run it. So this ties back to the fact that when, our, when the JVM starts up, modules that are available to you are the ones that, that are keyed off of uh, Java SE. By using web services, I now have to specify that I want to add something that came from the EE modules, which are not added by default. Um, now up to this point, I've been basically, there's actually several different types of modules. So I've just been talking about modules generically. Um, now, if, you, if you're running on, if you're, if you're not completely over to modules, um, you may be wondering, okay, so I depend upon this, this jar file, and they have not recompiled for modules. They haven't provided a module.info yet. You know, what happens? You know, how does, how does, does that mean that every dependency that I have has to add a module-info to, to their jar file for it to become a module? And the answer is no. We've got something called automatic uh, modules, um, which is a mechanism for using jars which do not include a module info Java configuration file. Um, it exports all of the Java packages, you know, are public, right? So there's nothing that's restricted. Um, it reads all other modules, and the module name is dynamically generated from the name of the jar file. Um, we also, there's also the concept of an unnamed module, which is all the jars that are on the class path. Um, so with Java 9, even if you're not using modules, the module system is still running. Um, so if you start up a, a run Java, start up Java code using the class path, everything ends up in the unnamed module. Um, so it's similar to automatic modules. Um, the, the unnamed module does not per, does does not have a name, and it can't actually access anything that's on the module path. And then finally, we have platform modules, which include the JDK modules, which are separate. So when starting up your application, if you use the module path and it's module draw draw file, the application loads. The, the, as an application module, um, if you use it on the, if you use a, a module jar file with module info file in it, and you pass that jar file in using the class path, it becomes an unnamed module. Um, and that's that's for a module jar file. For a non-module jar file, it'll create an automatic automatic module, which means it'll dynamically create the name based upon the the jar's name, and. The code, the code will work that way, and then if you use it on the class path, it's an un unnamed module. Okay. Um, so this is talking about readability in terms of the modules. Um, so a named platform, so um, a named platform is, exp is exports all the packages. Let's see here. Um, so this is basically going over, you know, what module what modules can be read. So a named, so an application using modules um, can read the platform, application automatic. Um, the, the main one is getting down towards the unnamed and the behavior of that regarding if you're, if you're pulling in stuff that are modules. Okay. 
So moving on to automatic modules in a little bit more depth. So in this case right here, I have a my invocation library, which is going to try to do reflection, um, which is an automatic module, and it's going to try to do reflection on a class that's in org C in the org ct java admin package. And so this one has so org ct java admin depends upon a my invocation library, and my invocation library does reflection on a class name in org ct java admin and tries to do something. So how is that? So how is that actually going to work? So this is the code for it right here, the utility, and I actually try to do a direct invocation of a class in the other package. So I'm trying to do something that's kind of bad, you know, maybe it passed in a class name that it has to instantiate. Um, so what will happen is that you'll actually get an error um, down below um, that it can actually do the instantiation. And actually, the code actually, when I click next here, actually didn't show because it's behind it. Um, there, there's a way of fixing this, and I'll get that in the slides when I, when I release them. Um, but basically, you're going to end up doing an exports again in order to make it visible. Um, so some important encapsulation and kill switches that they added for Java 9 modules. So they added the add opens, which opens up a package. So if you're working with something that's legacy, you need to open it. Um, they also added a permit illegal access. So all code in the unnamed module can access other types regardless of any limitations. And the one caveat is that although this works on Java 9, um, they're going to supposedly, they claim to remove this from Java 10, so this is just, you know, this is kind of like your last opt-out, so you can use this to get around stuff today to keep your application running, but by Java 10, you'll actually have to have it fixed. So services, um, the service API, and this is an important component of modules, so the services API was first added in Java 6, um, it has been rarely used outside of the JDK, and for the Java 9 modules, it's been uh, greatly enhanced and altered for Jigsaw. So in this case right here, consider that we have a messaging API over there on the, over there on the right, and we have an implementation of the messaging API being an email module that provides messaging via email, and we have the org ct java admin package depends upon the messaging API. <coughs> So what we want to be able to do is fire up the application and have org ct java admin use whichever services we've added to the module class path on, on starter. So if we've added the email or the JMS one, it'll use that, whatever one, whatever one is discovered on the starter. So for defining a service, this is the code for defining a service, so I have my interface to define my message service and then I export it, right? And I specify that I depend upon model and that I export this messaging API. Okay? And so that's the messaging API module. So this is just defining an interface for messaging. I'm not actually defining any implementations within this module, just the interface for, for the messaging. Now over in the implementation of my service, I specify that I depend upon model, that I require the messaging API and that I provide an implementation of the messaging API with this specific class. So I'm saying I'm providing an implementation of this, serv of this service, and this is the implementation of it. And then I have my implementation down below you know, that implements the service. And then the code that, that I write to actually consume the service, I specify that I require that I use, that I require that messaging API, and that I'm using this service from the messaging, messaging API. And I can actually, and this is in the client code that's using it, I can actually get a hold of the service loader and say basically give me all the implementations of this service that are available on the class path that I can use. Um, now there's not, there's not like support for you know, default implementation, there's no default ranking of which services will be used, that is up to you to actually implement it. So moving on to Java, tool, Java 9 tooling. Um, now, if you're in a type of environment where you have to switch back and forth between Java 8 and Java 9, um, I recommend there's a JENV.io, um, which works on both Mac and Windows as well as Linux, which gives you an easy way to switch between the different, J, uh, the different JDKs at the command line. So you can easily specify you can have your current working directly only in Java 9, or you can have it system-wide Java 9. Um, so it allows you to basically, on a project-by-project -project basis, you know, ensure that you ensure that you don't have to, you're not, you know, mucking around with Java Home 
and uh, the path variable every time you want to switch between Java 8 and Java 9. So that was kind of instrumental in uh, the, the stuff that I work on at work. I'm exper I'm, all my work is still on Java 8, but I have to go off to Java 9 to test things. But I don't want to have my systems in some sort of, you know, uh, have custom batch scripts or shell scripts everywhere trying to switch between the two of them. So this one really makes it easy. Um, and by the way, just as a note, I didn't mention this before, but RTJAR and Tools.JAR were removed from um, Java 9. So if you're expecting those, are, those are actually gone as well. Um, in terms of tooling support, IntelliJ, um, since 2017.1, back in March, has supported Java 9. and actually has really nice support for Java 9. Um, Apache NetBeans 9, which is currently in developer preview, has support for Java 9. Eclipse, I've not used in a couple of months, so I don't know where their Java 9 support currently stands. It was running a little bit behind. Uh, Maven and Gradle, I both have those as orange. Um, they now run on Java 9, the most recent version of Maven and also Gradle 4 run on Java 9, but they're not using the information from, say, your POM file to generate the, uh, the module descriptor file for you. So you still have to do that manually. So right now there's, there's still a missing link between, you know, what, between what your Maven and Gradle build says are your dependencies. They don't actually automatically populate your module definitions for you. So that's why I'm giving it kind of a mix right now. So right now you can compile your code, you just have to do everything manually yourself for the module support. Um, and with, with Eclipse, one of the challenges that I've had is that Eclipse won't start with Java 9 installed, even if it's not for the default JVM. Um, it would actually detect Java 9 and then you'd have to edit the INI file in order to get it to work. Um, and then just because um, Maven proper runs on Java 9 doesn't mean that all of its plugins work on Java 9. So this is still a work in progress, so I'm, I, I think some of these are constantly changing. There was an update that was sent out a couple, of, about a week ago, um, changed with, you know, some of the plugins we're now supporting Java 9. Um, but anyway, it, it, you, have to, you have to evaluate what your total ecosystem is, just not whether Maven works, it's also whether the Maven plugins works. In the same way that, you know, your application, your code may be fine, but a dependency may not, may not be okay. So it's going to take a little bit of time for all the tooling to catch up and all the dependencies to catch up with Java 9. Um, the one thing that will cause you a problem on Java 9 with Maven is if you're using the Maven Shade plugin in Jigsaw. Basically, what, if, you're, if you're basically generating Uber jar files, you're going to need to revisit and possibly re-implement this using JLink. Um, because with the Uber jar files, what you're doing in the past is you're taking your compiled output and taking all of your dependencies, unpackaging all of them and repackaging them as one jar file, um, which obviously with, with modules is not going to work because you um, it kind of defeats the purpose of it. Um, so uh, the NetBeans developer preview requires Java 9, so they have new project templates for module projects. They create an ant build file, so if you, want to, if, you're, if you download the developer preview of Apache NetBeans, you click on uh, Java module project, it, it'll take you down the line. You can easily right-click and say add new Java module and, and do that. Um, now, one of the things that they're not currently, they do not currently support yet, is that if you try to import, um, try to use classes, say, from JavaFX, they do not automatically um, detect and add to your module file your dependencies, right? So you still have to manually do that. Um, IntelliJ, on the other hand, is supporting that, so if you import a class, or attempt to use a class that you do not, that you've not yet added to your module file, will flag it and automatically add it for you, like it does for auto-importing. Um, IntelliJ support was added, as I mentioned, back in March. Um, it's a little bit trickier to set up the project. You start with a multi-module project, so you start, I start with an empty project, and then I add new modules for each jigsaw module that I want to create. Um, IntelliJ is nice that it detects when an import requires a module definition. Um, the other nice thing with IntelliJ is that they've got a nice graphical view that allows you to see your module dependencies. And so with that, I'll quickly Demo, I think I have time, right? The first one I'll show off is NetBeans. Um, so this is the NetBeans developer preview. You create do a new project. And I'm going to create a modular project. Click Next. Give it a name, 
and there it creates an empty project, basically an empty project. Now I can add modules to that. So I go new, add a new module. Add services, and as you can see, it adds a module definition file for me automatically. Right? Um, now I, I should have used reverse domain name uh, notation when I created it. Now I can add another module. Admin. Okay. <coughs> yeah, cloud package to this. And then down in services, I can add a, another package. Now for services to depend upon it, I have to add imports. Ah. Requires. Requires admin. And now I can use code in the services package that I can use that uh, email service that I just created over here. Um, so that's, that's basically the structure for NetBeans. If you're using IntelliJ, um, you'll create, initially you'll go through a new project. You'll do empty project by default. So it's a little counterintuitive and then you'll add modules to it from there for each one of your Java modules. Okay, so now for best practices. Um, so, uh, you should immediately start, if you're not doing this already, use, run back to the office, use JPENs to analyze, your, to analyze your APIs, find out if you're using any internal APIs that are, that are, that are gonna cause trouble with Java 9. Um, check transitive dependencies. So I keep repeating this, you have to check all of your dependencies, not just your code. You have to check everything that you depend upon. Um, integrate it into your continuous, in, continuous um, development environment, use the Maven J depends plugin um, for that. Um, take a look, analyze for if you're doing reflection, um, doing reflection on code. Are you using set accessible true anywhere to get at something? So say you're trying to work around something and you know some of the issues on the swing side are using set accessible true to drill into an API that you're not supposed to have access to. Um, also refactor code to remove, remove duplicate packages across jars. So if you've got, you know, comfoo.utilities is a common pattern where you've got umpteen jars of your company that has comfoo.utilities, you might want to start, you know, better factoring that so that it'll be easier to move to modules in the future. Um, if, if using internal JDK APIs, fix or f use flags, so you, these are for, for getting around using, um, so you can use, you know, permit illegal access, add opens to get around problems today. Um, and if you're using any, anything removed from the JDK, for example, the example, for example, add the activation jars, you can do add module and then add the activation, add that partic particular module back in, like I showed you before, with web services. Um, now the other thing is that tools such as IntelliJ have a DSM, um, which allows you to analyze the dependencies of your application. So if you've never looked into a DSM before and you have a large application, you can actually. Um, it takes a little bit of getting used to, but it can actually show you the dependency relationships between your code. Um, the DSMs were originally developed in the, I think it was in the aircraft and manufacturing, where you wanted to find out if you were running behind on this one bolt, what would be the downstream ramifications of missing that part. So a DSM is a nice graphical way of seeing the coupling within your system between your code to try to figure out, you know, where you can modularize and where your problems are going to be. Um, and that will also help you identify things for like cycles between code. Um, because right now Java for a long time has allowed us to write kind of bad code. Um, and with, with Java EE and Spring, uh, support for Jigsaw remains unknown. Um, I believe Spring is running on Java 9, at least Spring Boot. Um, there's going to be a major effort required to get the containers onto Jigsaw. So for example, uh, I know that Glass, I don't believe Glassfish currently starts on Jigsaw. Um, generally, the containers are always one revision behind, so they're still only certified for eight. So if you're writing Java EE applications, 
you probably won't be on 9 until your application container supports it. Um, regardless, however, you should start looking at any internal APIs that you might be using to get ready for that if, if it requires rewrites or finding alternate implementation of dependencies uh, for Java 9. And I think one of the impacts, at least from the apps that I work on, um, the desktop apps are going to feel are going to feel more than um, uh, server-side applications. So if you're working on applications that are swing-based, maybe maybe they've been around for a while. There's a lot of hacks that you had to do within this, you know, in the, the, the J table package, um, look and feel type of stuff you might have reverse engineered. So I think that there's going to be a lot more problems with swing-based for, for desktop applications than necessarily for server-side applications initially. So I think there's been a lot of code hacks that have been done over the years to implement different things, you know, for the IDEs and also for desktop applications. So there's going to be many hacks that have to be done. So this might be the, uh, so as I like to say, the technical debt bill is due now. So in the past where you may have, you know, gotten around something in the, in the lower levels of swing by putting in a hack, now you have to actually fix it. Uh, best practices don't depend upon Java SE. Um, avoid using qualified exports. Uh, don't remove exports from a module in future releases. So once you export something, you really can't remove that because of, because of the lack of versioning. Um, keep module infos clean. So in this case right here, I, am, I, I say that I require JavaFX controls and that I also require JavaFX base, um, JavaFX controls included base. So it's basically kind of like trying to keep your imports clean, keep your, your module info clean as well. Um, and then there are two good books that are out on Java 9 module systems right now. Um, there's also the Java, Java Pocket Guide, which I wrote the chapter on for um, uh, Java 9 modules, and some links. And the, th the thing to realize when you're looking at the Java 9 module stuff is that they've changed how they're going to do things over the years. So if you come across a presentation or some blog entry from five years ago, that content may not be correct, right? Because they've, they've rethought things that kind of revamp things as they went along. So there's, been, there's a lot of stuff that's out there that's no longer valid. So generally try to focus only on stuff that's came out in blog entries or technical documentation that came out in 2016 or later. Um, you have to be very careful about some of the older resources that are out there. And that's it. So if you have any questions, uh, feel free to drop me a line. Thank you.